Hey, welcome back to Bridal Sewing Techniques, and today we're gonna talk about how to lower the back of a wedding gown. Are you someone who has experience with a mix of sewing, but is looking to get into the bridal sewing niche? This channel is for you. Hit subscribe to become a part of the community. So in effort to preserve your ability to watch every nitty gritty detail of this alteration, I am going to be increasing the speed sometimes. Um, some of the stuff will be edited out, but only if it is 100% a duplicate of what I had just previously done on the other side. Um, and if you guys have noticed, yes, I'm talking a couple octaves below my normal voice. I've been gone for a couple of weeks because I lost my voice due to allergies. So um, please forgive my voice. I hope you can still hear everything okay. So this is me basically clearing away the buttons and all the, the tailors tacking, the chain tacking that's holding these layers together. And I am working now at the inside uh, where the back zipper is. That's that back corner. And now I'm taking my razor and I am breaking the threads that um, the, the row of threads that is the seam that holds the top of the gown together along the back. So that would be holding the outer layer and the lining together. And then there's also another row of threads that they use that rolls that seam allowance over that helps reduce the chance of the bodice curling out at the top edge. So that's why when you're working inside of a gown, there's those two rows of seams and you just can't get it to lay flat. It's that second row of stitching. It's technically, it's called under stitching and we'll get into that later. Um, but that row of threads needs to be um, very often broken up so that you can lay the gown flat to work on it. Now I'm going to uh, boost the contrast here and peel away this boning that is extending up higher than, than what the new back of the dress is going to be. So I've kind of gone down and I'm drawing a line with my finger here to show you the new angle. We're only lowering the back of this gown by about an inch and a half total really. Um, but as you can tell from the picture, it's quite a dramatic change and it's very important to make sure the bride understands that for every inch she drops the back, the support of the gown is going to be changed exponentially. It's going to feel quite different in most cases. Also, this is very important to figure out whether or not a gown can even be shortened in the back please do refer to my other video that I just did a little bit ago about um, removing straps. I went in great detail in that video about the different support systems in a gown, um, when straps can be removed, um, and that's also applicable to lowering the back of the gown. So I'm gonna link to that in the description below. You definitely want to see that before you lower the back of the gown. Um, because if you lower the back of a gown that you should not be lowering, um, you can ruin the gown. It can just not be supportive enough. So there, I'm just melting the, the little stays together inside that boning before I cap it. Um, and whenever a gown is thick enough uh, to allow me to do that without the tips of it showing it all, um, I do go ahead and take advantage of that. Um, and so I heat seal the end of the boning before I cap it. These two have not been capped yet, but that's okay. We'll get to it. So here I am sewing and no, I did not draw on the dress. No, I did not even use a lot of pins. I just pinned the top of the gown together so that that couldn't be moved around. I made sure those vertical seams were aligned. Um, and then I basically drew an angle, um, with my row of stitches that go from the side seam to the, the new point of the top of the back of the gown. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open up, you'll see that I stopped stitching right as I got to the zipper. So I'm gonna open up all the way down to my row of stitches that I just did, and I'm going to separate the zipper and just kind of swing it out to the side. And I'm gonna tack it down that way uh, with the machine 
so that it's not moving around in there and acting up. Now, if the gown is kind of thin, that little tail of the zipper needs to be trimmed. So that way, if anybody presses the gown or if you can kind of see through it or whatever, you don't want the bulk of that zipper to ever interfere in the looks of the gown. So sometimes you should cut the tail. I don't have to in this case because this gown is plenty thick. The fabric is a beautiful, amazing woven uh, fabric. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, but plenty thick to where it's not going to show everything. Now I am going to leave that top loop that's actually protruding up a little bit. I'm going to swing around that and, and let that be included in the seam allowance that I leave so that I can tuck it back through because this bride wants the top button to be at the very top edge of the gown and in the center. Okay. So normally your buttons are a shade to the left or right. Um, but she would like this one pulled to the center and she would also like it to be sitting right on the tip top of the back of the gown instead of sometimes they're bumped down by like a quarter of an inch from the, from the top of the zipper. So um, I just kind of maintained that with leaving that loop there. Now I kept the pieces of boning that I cut off from the first side because they're going to be my template for my second side so that I can make sure that I am cutting and sewing with perfect symmetry. Um, some people use paper templates for this. They'll create a paper template on the first side, use it on the second side, that's great. I'm not knocking that, um, but this is how I do it. I keep my pieces and I use them as the template. It just kind of saves me a step. Also notice when I'm cutting the boning, I'm going way down into the crux of those scissors so that I'm not doling the tips. Um, but it's also important to know as a professional seamstress or seamster, sorry, 10% of you guys out there are actually guys. Uh, so it's important for you guys to uh, learn to sharpen your own shears. It's going to save you a ton of money um, and you can sharpen them on the fly. I do have a video coming up soon about that. So be on the lookout. Um, I do use an electric uh, scissor sharpener and it saves me a lot of grief and woe and a little money too. All right. So here is me pinning that template and then I'm going to go ahead and cut. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Also, don't forget in the community section on my page here on YouTube, right now I have a conversation going. I'm getting ready to have another Q&A video. So hop in there, go to my page here, hop in there in the community section and if there's something you would like me to address in a Q&A video, put it in there and I will try to address it. All right, so I'm gonna add some additional boning in the back. Um, you never want to leave a gown, well, in most cases, you don't wanna leave a gown with less boning or weaker boning than when you started. And when you're lowering the back of the gown or otherwise reducing the support structure of the gown, you definitely wanna step it up a little bit. So I'm actually gonna stack this boning um, onto that other shorter piece of half inch boning that we, that we had a few minutes ago. So I'm capping these on the machine. I'm just gonna line them up um, this you can do very efficiently. You can line up five, six, seven sticks of boning if you need to and just run through them all at once and then snip the threads. Uh, go ahead and do both sides. As you can see, one end of these boning pieces is at an angle. That's because it's going to be toward the top of the gown where the gown is coming down at an angle. And that'll look very nice if an imprint happens to show. If it doesn't, it's just going to be accurately supportive. All right, so I'm gonna take these pieces, stack them on the short, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. This is a new kind of sewing snack. You know how I like to insert little sewing snacks? Well, this is a literal snack. I did wanna to mention to you guys, I know we get hungry in the back room sometimes, and of course this is for those of you that aren't celiac or have weed allergies, but I find that these are the perfect back room snack 
um, pretzel rods. I do keep a jar of them in my back room um, because they are usually fat free. So there's no grease or oil that can get on the gowns. It's a very clean snack that you can have and not worry about contaminating your gowns. So, okay guys, break's over. Let's get back to sewing. So um, I'm gonna stack that boning onto that itty bitty piece. Um, could we have removed that piece? Yeah, we could have, it's not really doing much, but why not leave it? It's just another inch of support, right? So I'm going to very surely tack this, not this, uh, to the top where that muslin patch is that's capping the end of the boning. And then I'm going to kind of do a big zigzag back and forth and every now and then bite through that boning stick so that it cannot move. All right, so I'm gonna speed this up. We're gonna finish this one uh, and then we're gonna do the same on the other side. I always knot it three times. And then you're also gonna wanna do the clear hypo cement on your knots so they don't come undone. Now guys, this is not the time to step off of the train. Let me tell you, I guarantee you if I look at my analytics, I'm gonna see a huge drop off because people are gonna be like, oh, we're done. No, 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 stay. Because this is actually the most important part. Many a time we've seen gowns that we needed to fix. Um, if somebody brought us a gown that a, a previous seamster had worked on and they think it's a disaster, right? And it needs to be fixed. And it was not actually the main bulk of the sewing, what you just saw. There, there's not always errors in that. Um, oftentimes, it's the finishing work. That is what's really going to set your work apart, really make your work very high quality. Um, it's going to be reliable work, and it's going to be beautiful. Okay, so what you're going to see here is I'm stabilizing I've lined up those vertical seams to make sure they, they align both in the uh, lining layer and the shell layer. Um, I'm getting things aligned all the way down toward the zipper. You can see I'm kind of rolling that top edge as I work my way down, make sure everything is laying flat and flush. And then it's important after you do that, clean up all your threads, go ahead and zip the gown, make sure the top edges of the zipper and where you're going to button things that all of that aligns now if it doesn't align a lot of times a seamster will go ahead and turn the dress you know inside out and change that top seam so that the angle is the same sometimes that's necessary but most of the time it is not most of the time that can be adjusted with your hand stitching now see the side on the right how it's sitting a little higher then the side on the left zipping up a little higher that's actually something that i'm going to be able to fix with the hand stitching that i'm getting ready to do so no panicking required right here guys Okay, so lots of pinning going on. Lots of really kind of pinching and rolling the fabric. It seems like there's nothing going on, but it's super important. Now I'm pushing that seam down with my fingers right now and getting it aligned. And when we stabilize the top of that seam with the understitching, it's going to hold it in place. And then we also, don't forget, we have to put our hook and loop at the top of the gown too, and that's definitely not going to allow anything to move. All right, so I'm going to start this understitching with uh, several knots, and this stitching is very, very important. This is what I was just referring to when I was talking about that finished look. Um, this is really going to set the quality of your work apart. So I've got that knot established. What I'm doing is I've got a long, strong size one needle and I'm digging deep. I'm going through the lining and completely through the seam allowance and then coming back up through the seam allowance and the lining. I'm not going through the shell fabric or the outer layer of fabric at all. 
Um, if you accidentally grab that outer layer of fabric, you will have a pucker on the outside and it will have to be fixed. Spoiler alert, guys. I do end up doing that. Um, and as promised, I don't edit out my mistakes just to make myself look perfect. I make mistakes all day long, um, as does everyone else. And um, I don't want you to watch a perfect seamstress and you know, go bang your head against the wall frustrated with yourself. I can tell you right now, there's no perfect seamstress standing around here right now, and I'm alone in the room. So anyways, uh, take that deep dive, but don't catch that outer layer. You definitely want to evenly space these stitches, and you want the stitches that are showing to be nice and tiny and neat. All right, so I'm pushing all the way through right now. Why am I breaking that rule? because I'm actually at that vertical seam and I'm going all the way through the boning and I'm doing what quilters would call stitching in the ditch. All right, now I want you to look back at what I just did. I'm stabilizing all those layers together. I'm even gonna knot it. I'm making sure it's very neat in the ditch there, but I want you to see how I pushed that needle through because it was extra tense and we need to save the strength of our fingers okay so let's watch that I am pushing the eye of the needle against the table and pushing the dress against it and bringing the needle up through using that I also did it um, when I sent it through the first time I just had to flip the dress a little bit to make that work um, but always if it's super um, difficult to get through save your hands you know I wake up with swollen numb hands in the morning not a good sign um, we can't just keep abusing our hands save your hands any way you can so that means keep a pair of pliers handy um, push the needle through the tough spots by using the table um, as I'm showing or um, you can also um, use the the flat side of the blade of a pair of shears a lot of times I'll push it through with that the flat side of my nippers that kind of thing um, I did have this conversation with my uh, family doctor about you know how do I save my hands and she said absolutely the answer to it is use tools so we need to get better at using tools so here I'm going to complete this row of stitches. Now I did want to explain to you guys the difference um, in the type of stitches. I know a lot of you call this top stitching because from your point of view where you're stitching, you have visible stitches on top, right? So I wouldn't argue with anyone about that. It's a really common way of using that term, but technically top stitching is more of a decorative stitch um, although it can be functional as well, but it's more of a decorative stitch that's going to be seen on the outer part of the garment is what they're talking about, okay? Um, now here, just a little moment to the side. I, I drop down a little bit to do my knots, and then I'm going to tuck the tail. I'm going to stitch deep through the dress through one layer, just like that. Pull it out and stitch it, uh, cut it right there, and that's what I call hide the tail. So you don't have a tail sticking out, right? Um, so while, while we do the other side, I'm going to speed that up a little bit and I'm going to talk to you about the different types of stitching. Um, so again, top stitching is something that is intended to be seen. Edge stitching is another thing that you might think this is, is because we're, we're stitching right along the edge. Well, yeah, but edge stitching typically is more of a functional stitch that is seen on the inside and the outside. This would be if I laid this gown you know, right there in the throat plate of my sewing machine and sewed right through it, all the layers. That would be an edge stitch. This is technically called under stitching um, because it's kind of on the underside or just the inside of the garment and it's not intended to be seen on the outside. So again, if you get a pucker, you gotta go back and fix that pucker. Now, right now, I'm accidentally forming a pucker and I'll show it to you later. I discover it later on the mannequin but um, 
what, what I would need to do is snip that stitch where it's going all the way through and then just on this side go back through and kind of cover over that area with a good three or four stitches. I do not have to pull out the whole row, row of stitches. All I got to do is pull up that one offending stitch from the outside and then on the inside just thoroughly cover where that row of stitches begins and ends and that's sufficient. Now I do want you to notice at the very top, this is a very, um, this part of the gown is under a tremendous amount of stress and it can get stretched out, okay? So I'm going to right here, take my time and do three or four knots, three or four big stitches going through the zipper, going through all the layers I can possibly think of, but let my work be hidden on the outside. Um, and then I'm even going to go down and stitch that lining to the zipper um, with a few stitches and they're even going to kind of cross over the edge of the lining a little bit and I want it to be so secure that off camera I even did this one more time attaching um, working from that corner and then bumping in and attaching the lining to the zipper um, so it is very, very secure and we're not going to get that zipper rolling out and being ugly or the corner of the gown stretching. Um, so that's why I'm being super thorough here. Um, and you being super thorough here is going to give you, um, a very good looking garment for many years to come. Um, as you know, most wedding gowns are no longer just something that is worn, briefly in a very stiff formal occasion and can be very delicate um, nowadays we're trying to pull off a very delicate look in most cases but the gown still needs to be very strong because the receptions um, as you know are more like very long parties <laughs> so there's a lot of dancing and jumping around and carrying on that goes on in these gowns so we have to think ahead about that and up our quality and performance a little bit all right so now we need to do the hook and loop I'm feeling around in here making sure there's nothing in there that's too thick that's going to show up later okay so I'm going to superimpose this little diagram I did of a hook so that I can show you basically the pattern of stitches that I'm doing um, you're going to kind of go all the way around the little clover leaf look of the of the hook I'd love to learn the anatomy of a hook because th this is kind of reminds you of eyes but then if you say eyes then they picture that the eye part of the hook and eye and then I call the other part the hooky part <laughs> oh, do you any of you guys have vocabulary for this <laughs> don't forget take a second right now and hit the like button it helps so so much it helps you it helps me it helps the whole wide world hit that like button and always if you have questions comment down below we're still not done I'm gonna show you the loop that I do all right so you can see now I kind of go across between those little clover pieces and then I'm wrapping my thread around the little hooky piece I do that a couple times and then I go back toward the little clover parts and I knot this three times. <laughs> Super secure, guys. It's like Fort Knox going on. All right. So uh, what I was saying, I'm going to show you how I do my loop. I do have a dedicated video to the hook and loop, but I do not like eyes. I do not like putting eyes in gowns because when they get under pressure, um, they kind of uncurl and come apart. So I like to do a super strong loop. I think it's um, more invisible and it's stronger. So this is going to be an upholstery thread or at least a Tex 40 and doubled, sometimes quadrupled. I'm going to knot it and then I'm going to do at least three loops here. If I'm quadrupled, I'd probably only do one or two, depending on the strength of the gown. Um, all that gets factored in. So you're going to just have to use your judgment depending on the gown. But here I did a few, and then I'm going to knot it after I do my loops. Okay, now we need to lash those loops together. So I'm going to wrap around 
somebody. I am so sorry. I forgot, I forgot who it was. Terry, maybe? Gosh, I don't want to say the wrong name. One of my BST besties was mentioning she pushes this through eye first instead of point first of the needle. That way you don't accidentally grab something. I can see how that would really save some headache. So give that a try. But anyways, I lash those together and then I do a knot again and then I pull it tight and it kind of draws them up together. So you're going to need at least three knots. And then I have plenty of thread left over here. It's good and strong. So um, after I knot this, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to pull this thread through and I'm going to use it for my top button. Now, I'm not going to put this in like an ordinary button. Remember, uh, she wants the button to be in the center of the gown. Um, so it's got to have some room to get pulled over that zipper a little bit. So I'm going to leave a little bit of a gap in my loop there between the gown and the button so that I can form a stand. Um, now this is kind of a tailoring trick on some suits, you know, when the suit coats are wool or it's an outdoor coat, like a top coat, they're a little thicker. You always have to put a stand in there so your buttons aren't too tight. So I'm going to wrap that stand and then bring my needle back through and knot it. And then I'm going to move down and do the traditional button sewing, which I'm not going to bore you with. I'm going to speed up through that. But um, what I'm going to do here, I'm hiding the tail again. What I'm going to do between the buttons is I'm going to knot between each button so that each button is stabilized independently. And when I skip down to the next button, I'm going to do it between the layers so nobody sees that skip. Um, so those are kind of the only tips that I really have for button sewing for you. I do like to go all the way through. Um, that way the dress doesn't pull funny. It's very stable. Now here I'm coming through with my Hypo Cement. Um, all of these products, you guys know, it's all linked to on my website on the products page. But this is the Hypo Cement, um, and I'm touching it only to my threads and knots. And that's going to really stiffen things up so none of these can come untied. Um, now, I have heard it said um, a, a garment will scream like, you know, hobby, home sewer, is not very experienced if your buttons are sewn on too tight. So always make sure that you give your buttons whatever necessary link that needs from the garment to do its job. So look out for that. If something is just looking off about what you're doing, you're not sure what it is, look at your button tension, okay? All right, so here's the before after. Uh-oh, there's that pucker I had to fix. So I hope that makes you guys feel better. Uh, when you make a little mistake, you can know Brenda LaBolt is right here with you making mistakes all day long. And here's a little video of me going back and forth. I know you guys really like to see the after pictures. Thanks again so much for watching. Hit subscribe, share me on social media. I appreciate you so much. I know what you're looking for. You've been sewing for years, but you want to get into full-time bridal sewing. But there's something missing. You're missing the backroom secrets, the industry tips and tricks. The tools, the sources, the techniques that give you the speed and the accuracy that the industry demands. You have found it.